Hello, welcome. My name is Norman Fenton. This short video is one of a series that I prepared concerned with probability and risk assessment. The topics covered in the videos range from basic introductory probability primers through to more advanced topics like Bayesian networks. I hope you enjoy them. There's an enormous amount of misperception about risk and much of the public confusion is caused by the way risk problems are framed and presented. And one of the most devastatingly important differences in problem framing of risk is the difference between presenting relative and absolute risk. So imagine a newspaper article with that headline, drinking cocoa increases risk of dying from rare disease by 100%. Would this story make you avoid drinking cocoa? Well, here's another story. And this one says drinking cocoa increases risk of dying from rare disease by 0.0000025%. Would that story make you avoid drinking cocoa? Well, the increased risk in the first case seems to be devastating. And the increased risk in the second case appears to be negligible. Turns out these two stories are describing exactly the same data, but from a different perspective. Let's suppose that this is based on a longitudinal study of the lifestyle habits of 100 people known to have the rare disease D. So we tracked all of the people known to have disease D as soon as they were diagnosed until some time later, typically until they died or were fully recovered from it. Typically with these types of studies, we look at all of their lifestyle factors, what kind of exercise they do, what type of food they eat, etc. There's a danger of doing that, and we looked at the danger of doing that in a previous lecture. But let's suppose that we discover that drinking cocoa does seem to have a significant impact on risk of dying. In particular, we found that 20% of the people drank cocoa, and we're going to assume that that's roughly the same as the population generally. There's nothing about the disease D which makes people more likely to be cocoa drinkers. So 20% of them drank cocoa, like the rest of the population. But of those who drank cocoa, 10 out of the 20 died compared to the non-cocoa drinkers and there were 80 of those and only 20 of those died. So 50% of the cocoa drinkers died compared to only 25% of the non-cocoa drinkers. Now as 50 is twice 25 we can say that the risk of dying is 100% greater for cocoa drinkers than for non-cocoa drinkers and there's nothing wrong with that but that's what we call the relative risk. Whereas the absolute risk of dying is 25% greater for cocoa drinkers than for non-cocoa drinkers. So the relative risk increase is 100% and the absolute risk increase is 25%. And at this point you might be thinking, well, hang on a sec, on that previous newspaper headline, which I said was equivalent to the first one, the risk increase was minuscule. It wasn't anything like 25%. Well, the difference is that what we're talking about here are the relative and absolute risk increases for people with disease D, i.e. these figures only apply to people with disease D. But what about the rest? Well, we know that only one in a million people have the disease. So we can think of the people in the study as being all of the people in a population of 100 million who have the disease D. So in that whole population, we can look at the cocoa drinkers, non-cocoa drinkers, and those who died from disease D and those who didn't. So again, assuming that 20% ratio of cocoa drinkers in the entire population, what we can say is that we know 10 died from D, but all of the other cocoa drinkers definitely did not die from D. And that's 19,999,990. And of the non-cocoa drinkers, we know that 20 died from D, but that means that the other 79,999,980 non-cocoa drinkers did not die from D. So now let's look at the risk figures again. What that means is that 0.000005%, namely 10 out of 20 million, cocoa drinkers died from D. And that compares to 0.000000025%, i.e. 20 over 80 million, of non-cocoa drinkers who died from D. So for the population generally, the relative risk of dying from D is still 100% greater for cocoa drinkers 
the non-cocoa drinkers because 0.000005 is twice 0.0000025. But for the population generally, the absolute risk of dying is only 0.0000025% greater for cocoa drinkers than for non-cocoa drinkers. So unless you know you have D, the relative risk increase is 100%, whereas the absolute risk increase, which is the more meaningful one for the population generally, is that incredibly low number. So relative risk tends to provide a grossly exaggerated perception of risk to the general public. It frames the risk in a particular way which creates that deception. But it's a standard media choice because it tends to provide more sensational headlines. In what follows, I'm going to explain, using further examples, why absolute risk is not only a more sensible measure of risk, but it's also more meaningful in a natural, causal way. Let's suppose a major study of MSc students has been undertaken, which has discovered a relationship between whether or not students join a gym and their exam performance. So we find that 4% of students in the study who are on MSE course, who are members of a gym, fail the course. 5% of the students on an MSE course who are not gym members fail the course. So we can see that failures amongst those who are members of gyms run at 4% compared to failures for those on the course who are non-members of gyms at 5%. So it seems clear that people who are members of a gym are less likely to fail the course. Alternative way of looking at it, if you don't join a gym, you increase your risk of failing the course. Now, we would say that the relative risk of failing is 25% greater then for non-gym members than for gym members, because as you can see, 5% is 25% greater than 4%. And that's how the risk is generally presented. There is a 25% greater risk of failing the course if you don't join a gym. And that sounds quite startling, so would you pay the money to join? Well, actually, probably not, because the absolute risk of failing is just 1% greater for non-gym members than for gym members. But interestingly enough, the 1% increase is not what we're told. We're told that there's a 25% increase. Rarely, if ever, are we actually given these percentage numbers to compare. We're simply told there's a 25% increase in risk, and we don't know what the difference in the absolute risk is. Well, let's actually look at it. Let's imagine that there's 100 non-gym members. So we know that about five of those will fail the degree. And let's compare that to 100 gym members. And we know that four of those will fail the degree. So basically, joining a gym saves about one in 100 gym members from failing their master's degree. So for every 100 gym members, only one is saved from failure by their membership. And when we look at relative and absolute risks as probabilities, again, you can see that the absolute risk means something very obvious from a probabilistic viewpoint, whereas relative risk is much more complex and subtle. If we assume that gym membership has a causal influence on success or failure in the exam, let's suppose there are no confounding factors, then we've got this very simplistic causal model that gym membership influences whether or not you fail your degree. If we compare the probability of failing the MSc for cases where gym member is true and false, we can see that when it's true, the probability of failing is 4%. And when it's false, the probability of failing goes up to 5%. So the absolute risk is simply the direct increase in probability from being a gym member to a non-gym member. But there's a complex but interesting interpretation of the relative risk, other than simply that relative difference between the 5 and the 4%. Specifically, the relative risk is telling us about how we revise our belief about the probability a person is or is not a gym member if we know whether or not they failed the MSc. What you can see here is that if we know a student fails, then the posterior odds that the person is not a gym member increase by 25% over the prior odds. So the relative risk is the increase in the posterior odds. Interesting enough, if we find out that they don't fail the MSc, then our belief in the probability that they're a gym member has only increased fractionally. This is because there's already 
a high prior probability that they won't fail the MSC. So finding that they haven't failed it doesn't really give us a lot of information. Hence, we only see that slight increase in the probability of a person being a gym member. Whereas the previous examples were hypothetical, here's a typical but real example of the problem. This report claims that drinking two glasses of wine a night triples the risk of mouth cancer. Now, let's put this into context and let's see what this really means. First of all, what the report doesn't tell you is how rare mouth cancer is as a cause of death in the UK. So typically we have about half a million deaths per year in the UK and around, let's suppose, 84 of those are from mouth cancer. Now, I've tweaked the figures here a little bit so this is particularly simple to understand, but these are roughly what the figures actually are. Now, of course, what we've got to consider here is that a large number of those people who die, let's say 20%, drink two glasses of wine. This is a very common thing to do. And that means 100,000 of those who died drank two glasses of wine. But we know overall only 84 died of mouth cancer. So what this means is that the absolute number of mouth cancer deaths divided between wine drinkers and non-wine drinkers must look something like this. Or in absolute terms, 36 out of the 100,000 wine drinkers died of mouth cancer and 48 of the 400,000 non-wine drinkers died of mouth cancer. And that gives us this tripling of the relative risk of dying from mouth cancer if you're a wine drinker compared with your non-wine drinker. So indeed, the relative risk is tripled. And that's the kind of data that led to the claims in this study. But the absolute risk only increases by 0.024, that's 24 in 1,000, which means that only 24 in every 100,000 regular wine drinkers would be saved from mouth cancer if they'd not been wine drinkers. And that's a very, very different perspective on the risk that people get than if they're simply told that the risk of dying from mouth cancer triples if you drink a couple of glasses of wine a day.